Blender 5.0 is now officially beta software, which means that all of the features which are planned have been added, and now the developers are just fixing up a few bugs in time for the actual release on the 11th of November. This is one of the biggest and most exciting Blender releases in a very long time. I've been using Blender 5 for a few weeks now, so in this video I just want to talk about some of my favourite new features. My latest course, Isometric Spaces, has just received a huge new update. Module 2 adds 6 hours of bonus content, covering the creation of an animated cyberpunk hackers layer. Isometric Spaces is a really beginner friendly course, but this module ramps up the challenge with some really cool effects like holograms and procedural lighting effects. Right now you can save 40% on all of my courses with the promo code FLASH40 at Gumroad. You'll find a link in the description. The sky texture, which is available in the world shading nodes for adding a sky environment to a Blender scene has been significantly updated. I never used to really like the old version very much. It's not something that I use a lot. Uh, I just didn't really think it looked very good. It's kind of all very monochrome. You get all these just sort of same colors. And I don't think a lot of the time it looks particularly realistic, but this has been updated now from single scattering. We now have multiple scattering. And as you can see, we have a much more realistic scene here where we have different hues around the sun compared to everywhere else and a much nicer more realistic gradient if you play around with the various controls for things like ozone you can actually get some really nice looking results with this i've been playing around with it quite a lot i'm trying to figure out scenes that i can use this on because i think uh with a bit of fine tuning you can get some really nice results here believe it or not adaptive subdivision is no longer an experimental feature for almost the entire time that I've been using Blender, it's had this feature called Adaptive Subdiv, which is really handy, but it's never been actually finished off and integrated into Blender properly until now. So what is Adaptive Subdivision? Well, basically it's a way that you can add more detail to your renders without crashing Blender or having extremely long render times. So to give you an example, I have just a standard plane here with a texture and it's got a displacement texture as well. Now, if I add a subdivision surface modifier to this and I start increasing the viewport levels, you can see that we get more detail here, but we quickly get to this point where Blender by default already doesn't want to go past six levels, and this is still looking very low resolution near the camera. What adaptive subdivision does is it basically chops up the mesh into smaller amounts for finer detail, depending on how close to the camera that part of the mesh is. So over in the background here, we'd still have quite low resolution, but where you can actually see the detail, would get more detail. This used to be hidden away because it wasn't finished and wasn't quite working properly, but now we'll have this option by default in the adaptive subdivision section over here. And you can see as soon as we click this, we get more detail and we'll get basically eight times more detail when we actually render it compared to the viewport. But what this is doing is it's just chopping this up really finely close to the camera and we're getting a low resolution much more lightweight version where you can't see the difference now two things to mention about this you have to have the subdivision surface modifier at the bottom of the stack if we add say an array modifier you can see that that's disappeared it has to be the last operation that it runs so if we put the array before it it appears again and number two, we now have this option here, space, pixel, or object. If you're using an instance mesh, you're going to want to have this on object. That's just because instances need to use the same mesh data. But obviously, if you have two meshes that are different uh, distances from the camera, they can't use the same mesh data. So you want to switch this over to object instead for instances. One of the long-term goals of the Blender development team has been to replace the traditional modifiers with versions that under the hood use geometry nodes. The idea is that from a user point of view, it will make using geometry nodes as simple as using the regular modifiers, but will now have much more control. And the first version of this has now been added. We have some modifiers which are now based on geometry nodes. So one of the most common things that we do in geometry nodes is just scatter an object on top of another object kind of like a particle system a hair particle system so if we add a modifier here go to generate and we'll go to the bottom you can see we've now got these three options here and we can say scatter on surface 
and you can see that it adds these points you can increase the density of the points and the uh, different distributions over here we can also select say this cube as our instance object and you can see these are way too big so all we need to do is go down to the scale make these say 0.1 and we now have our points really quickly distributed we can also randomize so let's say we want to randomize the scale on these and have some of them smaller we can randomize the rotation right let's just put these like this so if you wanted to have loads of rocks or something scattered around really really simple to do uh, it's something that in geometry nodes takes quite a lot of setup for what is a very common task what we can also do here let's say we add a cube into the scene we can go down and we have another version of the array this is the original array up here and this is the new one based on geometry nodes which adds a lot of much needed functionality things that we've been asking about for a long time in blender so the standard controls work just like your regular array but we now also have the same randomized controls so we can randomize say the rotation and we can randomize scale which is something that i've been wanting to do for a long long time it uh, makes using an array much more practical and this is the final one which for me is worth updating to blender 5 just for this circular arrays i don't know how often in blender i'm modeling something that is based around some sort of circular symmetry like say the details on the side of a column or legs on a table or something like this and it's now as simple as just adding this array modifier and you can make lovely circular arrays without any hassle the modifier panel isn't the only place that we're going to be seeing some really handy presets added to blender i have this monkey head here and if we give it a render and then jump over to the compositor you can see that things look a little bit different to how they normally do so if we press new here you can see it'll automatically connect up our viewer node and the group output and it's all connected over here but we also have this asset browser which is open at the bottom and the reason what we have this is because compositor nodes are now classed as a data block in blender which means it's something that can be shared between different blend files so we have these presets at the bottom here they're all just made up from the old uh, blender compositor nodes but they're presets for really common actions so for instance if you want to add a vignette to your scene that's something people do quite often but it used to take a few nodes to set that up now you just drag this in connect it up and it's going to add this automatically one thing that i think needs to be fixed about this however is you can't just drag and drop straight on top you have to drag it into your scene and then add it afterwards but there's some really useful effects in here like this film grain which is obviously something that people are going to be adding a lot of the time to the scene to emulate uh, a film camera and it actually looks pretty good these are all just basically node groups so you can go into these and you can see it's node groups within node groups they're all very complex setups but we have a lot of different controls here right we can do like monochrome and things like that we can animate it so if we jump to a different frame it's going to change on every single frame and we also have um, sensor noise which is basically the same thing but for digital cameras and of course we have chromatic aberration which i think is over here get rid of this one something we add all the time probably too much as vfx artists chromatic aberration which just adds that color fringing around the size to replicate imperfections in a camera lens so this is all possible like i said because it's a data block which means that we can also just access all of our different nodes up here in the drop down and like i said you can share those between blender files if there's some nodes that you commonly use all the time to kind of try and get a similar look across all your different renders this should save you a lot of time the next update is extremely important to talk about because it is actually a breaking change that can mess things up if you're not careful one fundamental limitation that blender's always had is that it can't deal with extremely dense meshes and i'm talking a object that has hundreds of millions of polygons that's just a fundamental limitation to how the dub blend file system works so that's been changed in blender 5.0 the actual files that are used for saving and hold all the data in blender will be different behind the scenes however 
That means you won't be able to open new Blender files in old versions of Blender. If you try to open a file from Blender 5 in Blender 3.6, Blender 3.6 just doesn't even recognize that as a Blend file. I think the only exception to that is Blender 4.5 because they knew this change was going to happen. It does have some like forward compatibility. It can, to some extent, open up newer files. But other than that, this is kind of going to be a cutoff point where you're going to have to just always use Blender 4.5 or after if you're working on files that were made in Blender 5. So if we navigate over to the render panel over here and we come down to color management, what you'll see is that under view, we have two new view types. We have ACES 1.3 and ACES 2.0. ACES was created by the American Film Academy. Those are the guys who do the Oscars. And it was designed to be a kind of standard color management system across the industry. So if you're using different workflows from other studios, the idea was that this would standardize it so everybody's kind of looking at the same data or presenting the data in the same way. This is something that a hell of a lot of people who were working in the industry have been asking for for a long time. So they don't just get one version of ACES, they now get the old one and they get ACES 2.0, which I think is the latest version. If you're not working in production, this is probably not going to make a difference to you, but it could make a huge difference if you're in a studio system. The algorithm that Blender uses to calculate volumes has now changed. The old system was a bias system, which means it kind of is cheating the rules a little bit. And it did sometimes create artifacts, especially if you had multiple volume objects kind of overlapping each other, you'd sometimes get these weird blocky artifacts. Uh, I found that the new system generally works better, but apparently there are some scenarios where it might actually work worse. But you don't have to optimize it like you did with the other version to get really good results and faster renders and things. If you do ever need to use the old version, for instance, if you're rendering a file that you made in Blender 4.2 or something, it will look slightly different. So if you want to use the old version, you can just go to the render panel, volume, and select bias. And that will give you all the settings that you used to have to play with to get decent renders out of volumes before. But I've been using this uh, new null scatter system and it seems to work very well. So to round things off, one nice little change that I've just noticed in this version of Blender is to do with the lattice tool. In Blender, we have this option for lattice, which basically just adds a box. And if you select another object and add a lattice modifier, and then select the box. Any changes that we make to this box in edit mode will affect the mesh as well. So we can scale this and we can modify these points. And it's sometimes a really nice way to kind of um, animate objects changing in shape or if you want to control how objects are morphed. But that does take a little bit of setup and it can be quite annoying. So now in Blender, if you have an object like this selected and you go to lattice, you have a second option over here, lattice to form selected, and that will just set everything up for you automatically in one click. I just thought that was a really nice change, probably something that should have been done a while ago. Let me know in the comments section which Blender 5.0 feature you're most looking forward to, especially if it's a feature that I haven't mentioned in this video. Make sure you check the link in the description to Isometric Spaces or any of my other courses where you can get 40% off right now with the code FLASH40. I'm working on updating all of my courses right now. The interior and exterior masterclass are both about to get a huge update. And you can actually get both courses for essentially the price of one if you use the code to get the masterclass bundle. Thanks for watching this video, guys. I'll see you in a few days with another one.